now i would like to uh, invite our friend uh, professor and dr ajit kanna who is a professor for french at jawaharlal university i am lucky that we were together in the same school of languages where i was studying spanish and he was studying french but i after his studies enter in more into entrepreneurship although i had always been linked with academics and research but i have uh, kind of explored more in the private domain otherwise uh, professor kanna had explored himself more into academic domain directly he was one of the youngest professors you know uh, assistant professors earlier and then associate and then full fledged uh, professor at gnu one of the youngest ones so uh, and uh, ever and all he is a very good uh, speaker and a, and a trainer and a teacher so let's let's listen to him and uh, then we will come back to to our, uh, to our another experts uh, dr vijendra sukla sir as well as sanjay dal sir so may i invite uh, please ajit tanadi to come out thank you thanks uh, modilingua uh, team and my dear friend good old friend uh, ravi kumar for inviting me to speak on translation on a special day as he announced that today is international translation day as well as national translators day i remember in 2004 i attended the, my first ever conference on the such day in uh, some hotel i forgot somewhere near ashoka hotel in delhi um uh yeah that was the first time i got to know that there's something called translators day anyway after uh, 16 years i'm happy to participate in such a day anyway let me plunge straight away myself into the subject the poster if you look at the poster carefully I mean, now uh, that my friend uh, announced uh, i am a, a professor of french and not french professor that's how the translation begins i am not french professor because i am an indian professor who is teaching french so this is semantically uh, uh, mistaken though we understand that yes ajit kanna we all in india understand this is an indian name so it's taken for granted that french professor is a professor who is teaching french that's not the translation you will be lost in translation so i'm i'm indian professor teaching french so i am professor of french is different from french professor that's my first observation and my first uh, view on translation uh, the second thing that i'm i will be talking about is there are few questions that we have to raise before we deal with any issue translation is a big big task there is something called untranslatability i remember my professor is talking about jack derida gayatri spivak and big names you know uh this guy um um uh, forgetting his name anyway the guy who translated this book uh, rahul sanskrit ends uh, from olga to ganga a very well known translator so uh, for why do we translate why do we translate first of all for whom are we translating what is the readability of this translation and who are, who is our audience who is our audience who is interested in french novels who is interested in uh, english novels who is interested in hindi novels so why should i translate so there should be a purpose let me quote gayatri spivak translation is the most intimate act of reading i surrender to the text when i translate so we have to surrender to the text when we start translating whether you like it or not of course you would have liked it you would have loved it that's why you you decided to translate that's first purpose just to inform the audience look here is a great uh, a piece of uh, literature great piece of scientific text a great piece of religious scripture lying untouched because you don't understand my language let me tell you the beauty of my language through your language that that's the first purpose 
second purpose is definitely for professional income you need income you need to survive a great writer like karl marx could not sell his writing Balzac died very, very poor. Nobody was reading his book. Nobody even liked his theatre, his drama, his play. Shakespeare was a was not a great man. Was not a successful uh, uh, writer, uh, uh, dramatist. Kafka, you all know about Kafka. After his death, his writings became very, very famous, thanks to translations. And thanks to somebody who, who, who promoted his German uh, books. The purpose, according to Hans Vermeer, he was a professor of linguistics at University of Mainz in Germany. He, 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 he spots, he identifies three purposes for which we do translation. As I said, the first purpose is to earn money. The second purpose is to just to inform the audience, look here, I have a beautiful text to tell you. A third is, a, a, is for studies, translation studies. What you call tradictology or translatology. So these are, these are three uh, 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 purposes for which we do translation. Do, when we do translation, there are some strategies to adopt, to follow. My professors in JNU or any, anyone who knows about translation, they would not translate just like that. They would read, they would tell me to read when I was a student. They tell me to read something called first reading, first hand reading, superficial reading. Just, you know, go through it. Just have a glance. Second is a, is a very close reading. Third uh, reading you would have memorized some of the cultural elements which are untranslatable. I'll come to that later. So these are some strategies that you have to adopt. I'm not going to in, uh, go, go into detail, but I let, let me just, just give you uh, two or three strategies just to begin with. There's something called syntactic strategy. You all know what is syntax. I'm just sharing it on the, um, on the screen. Please allow me to share uh, uh, Ravi. Please. Is it there? Yes. Yeah. The syntax. Just see the example of how in syntactic strategy, we make a mistake. One of the subcategories of syntactic strategy is literal translation. I'm giving you a warning that a literal translation is the worst translation one can do. It's, by, it's, a, it's a default strategy. And let me also say there's a very famous adage in translation. What is beautiful is not faithful. What is faithful is not beautiful. Example, kindergarten, kindergarten in German would be children's garden. But in English, the expression refers to the school year before preschool and class one, isn't it? KG, pre-KG, KG one, KG two, kinder, kindergarten. So this is what this, uh, we have to remember when we have to do the uh, 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 translation. For example, you have a beautiful syntactic uh, example. Uh, the boy jumped happily. The boy happily jumped. Happily, the boy jumped. The first two sentences, first two phrases, sentences in fact, are more or less the same, almost the same, identical. But this third one is not. I don't have to explain why the third one is not what, it, what the other two sentences mean. This is a strategy that you have to adopt. You have to be very, very careful. And all of you know about this very famous advertisement, Reynolds pen. The pen the world prefers is not the world prefers, this, prefer, prefers the pen. They are syntactically not same. 
the slogan, the caption for Reynolds pen is the pen the world prefers. It means it is the only pen that the world prefers. When you change the subject to the object, object to the subject. The world prefers the pen is the right sentence. It's a, it's a normal sentence. It's not grammatically wrong. Both the sentences are grammatically correct, but style. This is syntax. But the next is semantic strategies. Like uh, uh, Ravi and I, we lived in JNU. Oh, those of you who have lived in JNU or know about JNU, or even for that matter, any university uh, life, you have hostel named after rivers, named after some icons. Then we have something called Narmada Boys Hostel and Godavari Girls Hostel. One of the first one I stayed, the second one I frequented. Because it's a girls, <laughs> girls hostel. So boys hostel, semantically wrong. Why? Because we are men. It should be named Narmada Men's Hostel. Godavari Women's Hostel. So that is what is, is all about semantics. It's about meaning of the word. You've got to be very, very careful when you translate. Otherwise, it'll be lost completely. Anyway, the translation is lost. I'll come to that later, why it is lost. There is a loss of translation. The third strategy that you have to adopt, there are subcategories in these strategies that I'm just enumerating. There are subcategories in uh, syntactic strategies, literal translation, loan translation, etc., etc. In syntactic, uh, in semantic translations, you have so, so many subcategories, synonymy, antonymy, etc., etc. In pragmatic strategies, which is very, very important according to me as a translator, Ravi and uh, uh, other uh, experts, Shukla and uh, uh, Bell Saab would agree, agree with me that cultural filtering is what is the most challenging job in translation. These are some of the theoreticians who worked on this cultural filtering, Chesterman, Bergen, and others. They have realized, they have realized, what is they realize? What did they realize? That these cultural, culture-bound items like slang, like dialects, Bhojpuri, Avdi. I was reading, I was trying to read Kabir's Dohas in, in, in today for my preparation. It's mind boggling. With my little understanding, with, with my little knowledge in Hindi, I don't know Hindi, but I know the functional Hindi in my 26 years of my life in, in North of India. But I don't think I have that expertise to understand Rahim's Doha or uh, Kabir's Doha. So it is, this is intralingual translation. I don't know Tirukkural, the classic texts, the Sangam texts, one of the finest texts. It has been translated into French 18 times. Because why has it been translated? Are they mad to translate 18 times? I'm sure Hindi pundits should be telling me, you should tell me after my speech, I want to know how many times Kabir's uh, Doha ha, 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 have been translated in, uh, into uh, English or French or uh, in, into any other languages. How many times? Tirukkural was translated by, into French for 18 times, my dear friends. And I have my 19th, 19th translation, which I don't dare disclose. So what is a, a, what, these are the, some of the strategies that you have to follow before you venture into this, this, this very complex uh, uh, mm, uh, academic exercise or linguistic exercise called translation. What are the challenges, some of the challenges that you have? in translation. One may have to face court case if something goes wrong, you know. You may have to go to court. You may have to go to court if, uh, if there is a legal translation that you have done. 
I'm told the guy who translated Bible from Latin to English was burned to death. I stand corrected. I heard, I heard when I was doing this translation, somebody was narrating this story, like Galileo was, uh, was attacked. The guy who invented umbrella was beaten to death, stoned to death, because rain is considered to be divine. The guy is trying to stop this rain, protect us from rain. So he was stoned to death. Same way the guy who translated Bible from Latin to English was burnt alive. These are some of the difficulties, you see. It's a, it's, it's a challenge as well as a difficulty. It's a double-edged sword translation. So as I said, what is faithful is not beautiful. What is beautiful is not faithful. Like Kuran or you have a Doha. You try and... Uh, Try and translate the way it rhymes. It's very rhythmic. It's very rhythmic, isn't it? You all know better than me, Kabi's Dohas have this, this rhyme. And same, Tirukural also has, uh, it's quite rhythmic. So if you translate with the same rhyme, rhythmic effect, you are somebody, you know, special. It's so tough, but anyway, you can do it. Somebody tried in Tamil. I'll come to that later. I have a very uh, interesting experience to uh, share with you when I was learning in, uh, Hindi in 1994. That's when I came to Delhi for my BA. Uh, one fellow said, water is, if is, increase. Those of you know Hindi, if I translate, Pani hai, agar hai, badao. So he was translating in the, on the, uh, in the mess hall. Water is, if is, increase. It is very creative, my dear friends, for me. Though everybody was mocking at him. Everybody was laughing at him. But the, but the meaning is, is conveyed. But the translation is absolutely atrocious. And grammatically, it's gone, ungrammatical. But his Hindi is the intervention, is the bloody enemy for him right now. What you call mother tongue, I don't like this word mother tongue. And what happens to father tongue? If father is, uh, is from... Uh, uh, Mithilanchal and he speaks Maithili and mother speaks Bhojpuri. What would be his, their son's or daughter's tongue? Right? So, so-called mother tongue intervention. Hindi, Tamil, French, Malayalam, etc. etc. So what am I trying to uh, uh, drive a point here? What am I doing here? There is a, a very beautiful uh, um, phrase in, in Italian, traduttore, traditore. Traduttore and traditore is a, is a very idiomatic and rhythmic sentence, phrase in Italian. It, 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 simply, means, it simply means translation is always a betrayal of the true meaning of the original. A translator is a betrayer. A translator is a traitor. My colleague, um, Asha Puri, who teaches interpretation, she always keeps talking about this, traduttore and traditore. I'm thankful to her. So this adage, this adage is very, very fitting in, in, in terms of loss of meaning in translation. Lost in translation, there was a movie. It's a wonderful movie. If you all should watch, if you are, if you are in, this, in this field, translation field. A beautiful movie. So it's a, a translator is a traitor. This is a criticism, a positive criticism. That doesn't mean there are no good translators. There are great, great translators. You all read uh, some of uh, uh, Prem Chand's stories. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Prem Chand, thanks to translation. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known anything about North India, the Hindi speaking culture, or Urdu speaking, or Hindustani speaking belt. Kafan, Godan, Shatranki Kiladi, oh, what a beautiful uh, uh, you know, satire. So it's all happening because of translation. But at the same time, uh, the betrayal happens. The, the way you understood Kafan, I would have never understood and I have not understood even today. So that's why I, I evoke Jacques Derrida every time there's something called untranslatability and traduisibility in French. Untranslatable. You can't translate the untranslatable. You're taking a huge risk. So I'm coming to a next concept called lexical gap. This is called lexical gap. What does that mean? When you don't have right words, what do you do? You can't get stuck over there. You can't get stuck over there. You have to move on. It's like, uh, you know, a fast train. He was talking about fast world. Everything is fast. You want it tomorrow, man. I want it tomorrow. I, uh, I was like, you know, slightly nervous. Uh, Ravi Kumar, uh, he has invited me, but he has not sent me any uh, link. He's sending it just one hour before. That is the technology. Can you imagine, can I make it to his house or the place where he invited me in one hour? Impossible. So let's make full use of this technology. Our ideological differences. Yes, I don't like these virtual classrooms, virtual <laughs> these webinars. But how do we do when in a, in, a, in a pandemic situation? How do we do, do translation? When even now I'm translating unconsciously or simultaneously, I'll come to that later, simultaneous translation, interpretation. Whatever I'm saying, it's coming from my mother tongue. I mean, you know, in, 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 a, in a very, uh, in, a very uh, in, in nanoseconds, I know I'm translating it from Tamil, whatever I'm saying. And that's why I'm very... Artificial, I'm not very, very uh, natural at all. Because it's not my language. I'm foreign to English. I'm foreign to French. French is my fourth language. So this lexical gap, friends, this lexical gap is what is, uh, it will make you, will make you, you know, uh, will, will, will spin your head. You have to twist and turn the phrases. How do we say that? How do we say certain things in French? How do we say that in English? This is the biggest challenge. Believe me, there's nothing called perfect translation. Just like there's nothing called perfect methodology of translation studies. There are so many methods. There are so many methods in translation studies. So as I said about uh, Kural, Tirukural, one of the classical texts of Sangam literature, a noted Chinese sage says, translating a literary work like Tirukural is like the chewing of rice for another to swallow. Beautiful sentence. The chewing of rice for another to swallow. Dr. Karl Grohl, German translator, he says, no translation can convey an idea of its charming effect. He's talking about Tirukural again. It is truly an apple of gold in the network of silver. I'm just sharing that. Hope you all can see it. There's nothing to hide. So this, uh, these are some of the guys who translated these, this uh, uh, difficult text. That's why I picked up these names. You, can, you, you may ask me why these names, why not other names? Since I don't know Kabir, otherwise I would have picked up some of the examples from Kabir. I enjoyed the translation. Of course, I know a bit of Hindi, but it is written in Avdi. 
again, those who are from that Avad region would appreciate, would enjoy it, uh, would chew it much better than me. Kamal Swellebel, a Czech writer, uh, uh, he has worked on uh, uh, religious texts, classical texts of, of Tamil, Tamil classical texts, and he has also uh, 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 worked on Kural. He says, you have to translate it as briefly and as tersely as possible. As I said, somebody tried the rhythmic translation. Translator P.S. Sundaram, whose translation is available on the net, has attempted to render some of the couplets in Valua's own style with reasonable success. It's very, very tough, but anyway, he did it. So it's not impossible. Nothing is impossible. But if, 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 does, that, does it make sensible? Does it make any sense? Is it sensible? Is it, is it, is it making any sense? That's what is, is the end result of in, in translation. Let me straight away go to this origin of translation. I have another uh, funny experience to share with you. Translation is an act of representation or reproduction. I leave it to you. I leave it to you. Is it, are you reproducing or you're representing? I think both. But when you represent, you've got to be very responsible because you're representing your culture to another culture. You cannot misrepresent. Amo. Amo. I'm trying. So this is my, my own experience again. Two languages means you are equivalent to two persons. In Tamil, there is a saying. So uh, uh, in English, in Hindi, you have, how are you doing? If you translate, tum kaise kar rahe ho? How do you do, tum kaise karte ho? The response is very interesting in translation, in, in as far as, I'm, a, I'm not a native Hindi speaker, but when, when I heard, uh, then they say, Bas, my tikku, if you translate, enough, you make me listen. You are zapped in translation. Bas, enough. You make me listen. How is it going to be? This translation is chaotic. So this is what you are not supposed to do in translation. My very first translation was a death certificate. This is what I, my first translation experience. I translated a death certificate for, for a poor fellow who died in, in, in Togo. Togo is an African country. His son died. His father came to my room in Lucknow. I was teaching in Lucknow in 1999, 2000. He came searching for somebody to translate from French to English to claim half the money from India. He was paid 50,000 rupees from Togo government and uh, another 50,000 rupees from uh, India. So to claim that 50,000 bucks, he needed translation. So he showed me that certificate. Uh, sir, uh, can you please translate? How can I charge him? If you have conscience, he gave me 100 rupees. That is his honesty. You decide what you want to do. I didn't accept that money. But anyway, we had a cup of coffee because he, he knew that I'm a South Indian. I love coffee. So he bought me coffee. Are, uh, the, the origin of translation. What is the etymology of translation? You have two words in Latin. Very interestingly, the etymology of uh, translation is from Latin, but the etymology of the word etymology is from Greek. So anyway, this translation comes from two words. One is traducere, another one is translatio. Traducere means trans. Lasio. Trans means to the other side. 
and lasio means bring or render. So take it to the other side. You have transport. You have transpose. You have transfer. You have transcreate. You have translate. You have transmit. Transform. Like you have trans Yamuna. Transylvania. Transylvania in, in Romania, it means beyond the wood, beyond the forest. Transgender. I love this word transgender instead of third gender because third gender is discriminatory and hierarchical, just like first world, second world, third world. India is a third world country. Now that's why we say developing country. The transgender is a wonderful word for uh, that community. Transvestite, transversal line, transversal wave, transcribe, transcription, so on and so forth. So these are the these are these are some of the things that you have to remember uh, or you know master before you translate. You begin to translate. You got to read. You have to read. If there is any translation available, please read it. The transcription must be there. The printed form of translated version. In translation, when you translation, I'm tempted to speak about interpretation. You cannot overlook this, this, this field, which is interpretation. It's a very fascinating field in translation. Interpretation, I, I just quote this Nietzsche, all things are subject to interpretation. Whichever interpretation prevails at a given time is a function of power, not truth. Mark his words. Whichever interpretation prevails at a given time is a function of power and not the truth. As he said, uh, my friend Ravi Kumar said, uh, there are over so many languages to be translated, 60,000 documents in, in, uh, in Strasbourg, where the European Parliament is situated. Every session, 70 languages are translated, interpreted rather. There are three types of interpretation. One is simul simultaneous interpretation. Second is consecutive interpretation. Third is sight interpretation. Simultaneous interpretation, you know very well. Consecutive interpretation is take notes and then interpret. Sight interpretation is an oral rendition of a written text. So what is the difference between interpreter and a translator? Not, not, not much difference, but there is in profession, there's a huge difference. Translator, he sits, he sits in a corner and he, he translates and sends the document. Trans, uh, interpreter is present there and he is translating orally. It's a spoken and written. That's all. That's the difference. So the, I'm not going to get into this translation studies methods. It was developed in the way, way, way back in the 1970s. When translation has helped shape our knowledge of the world. If you and I know about uh, RSS or uh, BJP or uh, uh, Congress or any other movement in this country, reservation policy, or, or a scientific invention, uh, 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 discovery. It's all through the translation. Television is a big company for translation. I was offered 15,000 rupees for translating uh, election news for India Today. For one session, 15,000 bucks so a few years ago. So there's a lot of money and a lot of uh, uh, avenues if you are a good translator, a sensible translator. So it, it shapes our knowledge of the world and our own future. Yeah. Can what? I ask oh, one yes. question? Uh, five more minutes. I have one question for you. Yeah, yeah, just five more minutes. I'll wrap it up. Okay. I'll wrap it up. Just five minutes. Just two minutes. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah. I have some questions also for you. 
Sure, sure, sure. I am ready to answer uh, any question that you ask me. Right. I'll just uh, finish it with one last word. So this, uh, I, I gave you this, this, these two words, traducere and uh, uh, trans, translatio. I prefer both the words because both the words convey the same meaning. Well, uh, French has taken the first uh, origin, traducere. In French, it is traduire, uh, traduction. And French, English has taken the next one, translatio. Just N is missing in translatio. Translation. So with this, with this, I welcome criticisms, questions. Uh, if I, 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 may, I may have made any mistake, please correct me. I'll improve my my talk in the next session if I ever get to speak with you. Thank you, Ravi, and thank you, uh, audience, for your patience and hearing me out. Thank you very much. A, a, a great, uh, Ajit. Uh, you, you have given a very wonderful, you know, wrap up of variety of theories as well as your wisdom, including certain texts, some examples. A very good talk, you know. Uh, you know, uh, I wanted to add a little bit on whatever you said. When we are talking about uh, variety of uh, strategies, you know, let me uh, uh, let me give you a little uh, add-on to whatever you spoke, uh, Professor Kappa. Uh, you know, you had mentioned about uh, a, a philosopher and a professor, uh, Gayatri Spivak. I am a fan of her because she is the one who has been challenging Europeans Just a as well as Americans, you know, on uh, their approach towards uh, women studies in India as well as the world. She is the one she questions and tells Europeans, if you are very much worried about women in India, Go and live with them in the villages and then talk about their upliftment. So she is very bold in that sense. And she is one of the very well known feminist writers. Similarly, there is another one called Lilanjana. She talks about how, you know, Britishers came to India in disguise of uh, so called anthropology which was propagated as a science because science is something based on fact. Nobody can question, you know, those facts. And they came to India as an anthropologist in Oriental College, which they set up. And they planned, they studied Indian culture, Indian history, Indian laws, Indian technologies. They did observations and took it back to Europe. And this itself is a translation. Because when you are, uh, you know, observing someone and then putting your observation, it is a translation. This is what these Rishis used to do, you know, transfer knowledge from one point to another, one generation to another, from north to south, it used to go without any, you know, big difference of languages between north and south. But the knowledge from north used to go to south by what means? It, it was traveling in variety of languages from Kashmiri to Punjabi, from Punjabi to Haryanvi, Haryanvi to Hindi and variety of Avdi and then from Avdi to, 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 to you know, Bhojpuri, from Bhojpuri to, to Mathili and from Mathili to Bengali and Bengali to Assamese and Northeast and then China as well. So this is how the information used to travel from one language to another, one corner to another. And same thing was done with Indian history, which they did. They took it back to London and from London, it was translated into French, German, etc. And whatever they have written was half cooked information. It was not right information. That's why they termed Indian history before British period as barbaric. They forgot that in 1600 AD, in, uh, you know, in 1648, we had one of the most prolific uh, wonders of the world called Taj Mahal. It's the same time when in, in Europe, 
Buckingham Palace was established, and in in France there are variety of other you know established uh, monuments were established, or uh, in Spain uh, they had you know the golden period. The same golden period that they, they they ignored and said that this was a barbaric period, you know. So this kind of misinterpretation was done, and Nilanjana talks about it. There are theoreticians who have given different approach. They say no sense, no word, let's go to third space. Translator sits in a third space, nor in between text, nor between the, the context or the source or text, but in the third space. There are, there are academicians who say, you know, it is the translator who gives second life to an author. Means if you are a good author and if you were not popular at one point of time, and if you had a good concept, and the world remembers you. A day will come when a translator will come up and give you a second life. So if something which is totally dead, unknown, can get second life through translators. Similarly, there are theoreticians who say translators are the one who, who go and violate text in the sense they rape the text and put their scar there. It is very violent uh, form of uh, expression for which the communists always, you know, oppose because communists have been had a feeling that why writers are considered he and translators are considered she, why translators remain secondary to writers. So there are a variety of, you know, theories that one can try and study, you know, and it will help our young people and researchers to look into these dimensions and take approach when they are doing literary translation or when they are doing you know direct translation which is called functional translation there is a poly system theory because there are a variety of systems that work in a play there are systems there is no you know peer cut division uh, luhman you know a very well known philosopher uh, uh, you know as well as a medicine uh, expert, he talks about uh, uh, you know uh, autopoietic relationship between variety of systems in which we work in. Media is another system, politics is another system, society is another system, technology is another system, and all these systems you know they work and communicate with each other. And who helps them? It is the translators. <clears throat> so if you take up any of these, you know, approaches, I believe uh, a translator can do, can be able to justice during their rendering, during their interpretation, during the, but I would, you had mentioned about people were killed. Even in France, there is a, there is a very well known writer, a very young fellow was executed and his name is Diolet. Uh, you know, and even in modern times, this has happened, you know, if you are doing going against a system, you are gone. But now what I'm, my, my contention is that this uh, theory, this research, this uh, French, this Spanish, this German, all these, how it can help our, you know, translators, linguists in India, to take advantage and rethink and come back to you know Vedic life, Sanatan Dharm, our philosophy, our rich literature, which has been lost somewhere, you know, uh, because of uh, the scar which our masters, I will say, or colonizers, I will say, have put on us. There has been a big gap. So I, how we as a translator, uh, you know can help our own self, our own culture. Because now a time has come when knowledge that we were, you know, based, you know, system of education will be eroding because of the invasion of artificial intelligence. So if everything is done by machine, what will be left with? A dabba, you know, a box, kanastar is komlo bolte hai, ya, Another set of dynamism should come in 
and that takes us back to passion love ethics values you know which perhaps artificial intelligence will take more time to understand so in this uh, context uh, mr kanan uh, would you like to comment something and then after i will open floor to dr vijendra sukla sir please your voice is not coming you have to uh, you have to unmute Please. yourself yeah thanks uh, uh, thanks for your uh, uh, additional information uh, yeah uh, this uh, cloud uh, technology that's going to rule this uh, translation domain uh, it's like replacing uh, uh you know uh, hand uh, spinning mill with um, hand loom uh, spinning uh, power loom with the hand loom so uh, this is going to happen in technology also so we, we should be ready for all this uh, uh, what what i call onslaught uh, uh, a dominant culture uh, cultural invasion not just in uh, in religion or you know culture per se this is also a cultural invasion uh, the way we have now uh, uh we are dealing with virtual classroom uh is not the way we were dealing before pandemic so i think we we should be prepared for a kind of adaptation you know and adopt a few new method that's being imposed right now it's been imposed i'm not very comfortable talking like this you know i want to write on the board maybe you may call me conservative you may call me traditionalist uh but yes uh, yeah, uh i have some limitations artificial intelligence is is intelligence artificial i don't know uh it's it's natural i don't believe in divinity or godly uh, act but uh, it's my my hard work where i am right now i'm not uh, uh saying that i'm a self made man my friends like you have helped me learn hindi have helped me learn english i came with no knowledge in english and, and and hindi when i came here so i thank all my friends not the god i thank all uh, my intelligence not the artificial intelligence but anyway that's that's a, a different debate but uh, coming to this uh, i would love to uh, react to one of your observations uh, mm, that uh, mm, are we heading are we heading for a uh, a drastic revolution a drastic change in in translation drastic change you know as you said i translated 16 pages in in under 30 minutes it's there it's bloody there man in front of you six dictionaries available and you choose any dictionary that you want click and paste it copy paste and the translated version is coming the only job for you now is to check whether it sounds french whether it sounds spanish whether it sounds tamil or whatever language the target language and from the source language so everything has been done by machine has been replaced ajit is nowhere there ravi is nowhere there everything is uh, machine everything has been replaced by machine i would love to um, take more questions from the audience with the permission of the moderator uh yeah this is my reaction to this technological translation yeah there is this, there is another question uh, that has that is there for uh, uh, uh prof dr ajit kanna and the question is uh, uh you, you, there is a mention about uh, untranslatability uh, on you know i recall you had mentioned something on derida no uh, deconstructionist uh, it's a very uh, revolutionary you know concept that derida gave uh the, 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 the can you elaborate little bit on it uh, ajit ji yeah <clears throat> see uh, everyone was talking about in this whole panel we were all talking about the nuanced sense 
if every word has two aspects of understanding, two meanings, two aspects of meanings. One is literal meaning, another one is the nuanced meaning, the denotation and the connotation that you call. When I say uh, uh, mango, it is only mango. But in Hindi, you have something called Amadmi, you can't say mango man. Um, uh, if you are a Hindi speaker, if you, I don't know if, you are, if the person is Hindi speaker. So anyway, the literal sense and the nuanced sense that uh, Vijayendra Shuklaji has brilliantly pointed out, I saw a girl in the market. This is exactly what, what we are all talking about. Can machine understand this, this untranslatable? This untranslatability. Can you compare the uncomparable, they say, no? Incomparable. You can't compare Kabir with uh, Rahim. You can't compare Rahim with Bhardiyar. Bhardiyar has uh, translated his own, like Rabindranath Tagore, he has translated his own uh, uh, texts from Tamil to English. He has done more than 272 translations in, in just 39 years. He has translated Victor Hugo's uh, uh, a very, very popular novel called Les Miserables, The Miserables, as if he lived with Victor Hugo, as if he lived in France. He learned French for only 10 years in Pondicherry when he was hiding um, uh, from the British. He was there just for 10 years, man. I'm, I'm doing for this, 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 this profession for 30 years. Even now I'm shivering, I'm trembling to find the right word. This right word is untranslatable word. Derrida calls it untranslatability, undoability if you want, undoable. You can't do this because it's undone in your own culture. I was, sir, you, you, you were talking, he was reading that, uh, uh, that history prof uh, teacher, uh, that uh, Hindi Shari, right? The Canadian Niagara Falls. Say. So that one, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I missed it. I do, I'm not a Hindi speaker. I'm not a Urdu speaker either. I don't know what you guys, but you all, all Hindi speakers understood what exactly it is. You're all praising it. So that praise cannot come from, from me naturally. This is untranslatability. Ravi might uh, call me, hey, 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 you cannot translate that. Come on, that is uh, uh, impossible. But uh, if artificial intelligence can do it, that would be a great challenge. That would be a great challenge, I'm sure. But if, without human, human intervention, I don't know if, if that can be done. In, in 150 years from now, they say human beings can, be, can travel against the time. We can accelerate against the time. In 150 years from now, I read somewhere in science fiction. Well taken, my friend. There is another... Uh...